You're listening to Skills World, the podcast. News, views, reviews, and interviews in association with FE News. Hello and welcome to Skills World, the podcast. I'm Tom Buick, and over the course of this episode, we're going to be asking the question, are apprenticeships fit for the future? And I'm joined by two brilliant guests who will know all about this subject, both from a policy and a delivery perspective. So joining Skills World this week, we have Chinora Rostomova, who is the Senior Policy Advisor for Education and Skills at the Federation of Small Businesses. Welcome, Chinora. Hello. And Charlotte Bosworth, who's the Managing Director of Innovate Awarding, which focuses on delivering Apprenticeships. Welcome, Charlotte. Hi there, Tom. Now, Chinara, over to you. You've actually written a report about fit for the future in relation to apprenticeships. Why aren't they fit for the future? So this report is based on our qualitative and quantitative research. We've surveyed about 1,700 FSB members and we've also conducted a number of focus groups to understand how the reforms impacted small businesses. And before I criticise anything, I should probably say that the apprenticeship scheme we have in this country it's one of the best schemes in the world and and we shouldn't forget that yeah. because most of the time we forget that part but our research shows that there are a number of issues with the with the apprenticeship scheme first of all uh, the biggest problem the looming problem is the funding issue we should the system has been designed in a way that levy pairs money pay for non levy pairs mm-hmm. we all know that the funding will run out so we recommend that government seriously considers allocating more money for small businesses for non levy payers so that they are able to afford apprenticeships and the the apprenticeships are not capped. But uh, when it comes to system-wide issues, we found that one of the biggest challenges for small businesses when they engage with apprenticeships is the 20% of the job training. And there are other issues as well, for example, with training provision. So 20% of the job training is linked to training provision, but there are issues around with the problem of finding, they have problems finding training providers and also issues around the training provision itself. Well, we'll unpack quite a few of those issues there you've raised in terms of how small businesses are interacting uh, with apprenticeships throughout our conversation. Uh, but Charlotte, Tanara mentioned there that you know, we've still got a very good system of apprenticeships and it probably is, you're right, worth reminding ourselves that there are many countries in the world that don't have apprenticeship systems. We always, of course, like to compare ourselves to the Germanic systems, Switzerland and Germany. But we are now six years into the reform of the apprenticeship programme and it was very much reformed on the promise of a more employer-driven apprenticeship model, higher quality and better standards. And of course, importantly, this whole new process of quality assuring apprenticeships has come in with this whole new market that's developed in endpoint assessment organisations. Now, you're one of those organisations, Charlotte, but what do you recognise from sort of Chinara's analysis around perhaps where things are not quite going the way we perhaps had anticipated. So you're right to refer to the new system being six years in, but the reality is it's only in the past 12, 18 months that we've seen real engagement and real volume going through that, which has then given us that position to fully understand actually what's working well and what we need to put an effort into to improve. So I've seen huge engagement from employers, both small and large, in the system but there's a lot of things that people didn't know we asked employers to design assessments but actually are they best placed to do that we could have had their input into it but actually should we've got experts involved in an earlier stage in making sure that was right to do the right assessment because there was like a deliberate attempt to sort of shut out the expertise that for example awarding bodies have in this whole area of developing standards i mean you're right going back to 2013 there was almost sort of this ideology that it would just be civil servants locked in a room with employers that would hammer out all of these assessment plans and that now of course you're in the delivery mode some of these assessment plans are not that great are they absolutely so i think the intention was the right intention let's have everything driven by employers but it comes back to that point we don't know what we don't know as much as if i tried to play a role in that of some of our employers I I don't necessarily know the knowledge, skills and behaviours they need, so I wouldn't be best placed, but I do understand assessment. So it's about coming together, employers, providers, 
endpoint assessment organisations to come up with a collaborative way of working together to make apprenticeships and the system work. So, Charlie, you talked about in your report that, of course, compared to the legacy system of apprenticeships, we're still around 20% down in terms of the starts. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, some commentators would say it's not about quantity anyway, it's more about quality, so we shouldn't get too hung up about whether or not we've got 3 million apprenticeships. But I think there was something also in your report that you highlighted, which is the decline over time of what you might might call the the more entry level uh, apprenticeship mm. opportunities in the jargon of our world of awarding organizations we talk about levels level so level 2 and level 3 you have identified those statistics in your report in terms of the trend and the decline now surely that's a big issue for small businesses because conversely we're also saying that we need opportunities for young people Young people, by definition, in the labour market are looking for entry-level opportunities. There are very few 17-year-olds going straight into a senior management position. So there's a kind of a perfect storm, it feels to me, developing mm-hmm. where two-thirds of apprenticeships already go to over 25-year-olds. Meanwhile, you know, we haven't got, for example, level two standard in business administration, which was one of the most popular standards under mm-hmm. the old frameworks. I mean, your members must be hopping mad at the fact that they can't actually access those apprenticeship opportunities. Definitely, it's it's quite concerning the fact that level two apprenticeships have gone down by forty five percent and level three apprenticeships yeah. by thirteen percent. If you compare twenty seventeen twenty eighteen academic year with the pre reform year, and it's really concerning. And we do think that level two and level three apprenticeships are very important. Our research shows that eighty seven percent of all apprenticeships offered by small businesses are at level two and level three. So, why do you think the Institute for Apprenticeships and perhaps government more broadly? isn't isn't listening to that message because after all this is a message that's coming from employers you know from businesses it's not necessarily just a, a message from lobby groups that work in education so why do you think they're not responding enough to to that call i mean that, you know obviously I'm, I'm aware of the controversy around the level two in business administration i mean you you wouldn't be the only group that's calling for that in fact on a previous podcast i talked to the head of the apprenticeship service for the national health service you know and there's potentially ten thousand people that are going to miss out on that level two opportunity but how do you think we can arrest you know the decline in uh, entry-level apprenticeships i mean you know, should the government potentially target more the 16 to 24 year old route through the funding mechanism should it potentially even like you do see in other countries apprenticeships are not available over a certain age we have an all-age system these are the sorts of ideas i think that are circulating i mean where would the fsb be on some of these thoughts part of the reason why level two and level three apprenticeships have gone down it's it's the it's the funding issue sorry funding Uh, funding, uh, Mm. it's because of the procurement and i've heard personally from small businesses saying that they were previously working with training providers in their area and now they don't offer apprenticeships at level two and level three they don't have funding for it or even for degree apprenticeships funding is is an issue for for higher level of apprenticeships someone based in salisbury for example said said that they have to travel to bristol for their training which is quite far so it's it's really concerning and I think we'll start seeing the impact of it. Uh, I haven't heard as much from small businesses apart from because they don't know the levels mm. as well as providers do. But we'll see the impact, we'll see the gap, as you said, for the gap of not having level two business administration framework or a, a new start a new standard, standard for it. Yeah. We'll see its impact in, in the next year where I, I think small businesses will be coming forward and making the point that this is missing. In terms of how to make the government here, I think government is probably focused on the fact that the higher and degree level apprenticeships have been quite popular by employer with, with, with employers because it has a higher productivity. And that's understandable. You, impact. You know, higher skills, higher productivity. I mean, some would also argue it gives the whole apprenticeship system a bit of more cachet because now you can actually get yeah. degrees at apprenticeships as opposed to going to university. Charlotte, I mean, Innovate Awarding, an endpoint assessment organisation, you've got a healthy portfolio of standards at all levels. I believe I think health care is actually one of the yes. sectors that you're uh, very much engaged in these issues here about it's difficult for small businesses that are non-levy are you seeing that very much on the ground in terms of what's coming through down the pipeline with the endpoint assessments you're doing we've definitely seen the dynamics of our business from frameworks to endpoint assessment change we've definitely seen that we're engaged with a higher amount of levy paying organizations rather than smes Personally, I believe that 
an SME can provide the right coverage experience and give that full breadth of understanding. I ha- I'd like to go back to the level two point, though. You know, there is something. How can we get people to understand that lower levels doesn't mean less value? Yes. And that mm. is the big point we need to somehow overcome. And yes, we do require higher level skills, but also lower levels doesn't mean less mm. value. How can we get that point across? And that point, of course, was made back in 2013 by the review that instigated all these reforms. I mean, when there was then a, a sort of almost a definition of the apprenticeship programme was put out by the Richard Review, there was an absolute focus on the idea that A, apprenticeships, of course, are a job, first and foremost, you know, they're an employment contract, but that the focus of apprenticeships should be really on those more entry-level positions, which, as you say, Charles, doesn't necessarily mean low-value low skill it might be at a lower attainment level in terms of where you enter the workforce but then that the whole point of skills progression is to support people over time to climb up through those levels uh, you, you raised the point we operate within the healthcare space it's yeah. really interesting to see what we're seeing as the p- behavior and pattern there so yeah. there's healthcare support worker which is at level two which we are seeing as a really popular standard but what then is happening is people are going on to the level three and then ultimately going on to the nursing associate which is level five yeah. and actually people are using that prior attainment to support them on that journey to the level five so it plays a massive part in progression as well And I don't think we should be forgetting that, as we know that is something that is key to the success of apprenticeships and skills. So what's happening here then, Janara? I mean, you referenced the fact that the focus, in terms of new standards, the take-up and the starts stats show this, are are predominantly above level four. You know, they're in these management occupational standards. You could argue that employers are acting rationally, because particularly they're a levy ploy, so they see the money in their pot and they see the offer around them from level two up to level seven and... Not perhaps no surprise, you know, a member of the management team says, oh, I fancy doing that MBA at Cranfield and get it paid for via the apprenticeship budget. I mean, you know, economically that might make sense. Do you think morally that's a bit of a challenge for the levy budget, which we know is already under strain? We don't know exactly how much strain, but the rumour out there is it's already, you know, £500 million overspent, but let's see what the government says in the spending review. But, uh, I mean, is it, is it is there something immoral about a senior manager already quite well paid taking themselves off on a taxpayer-funded MBA, or, or should we be less uh, concerned about that? I, I'm, I don't think it's immoral. I think if they're doing it, then that means there is a need for it. And the research shows that the better leadership and management skills uh, businesses have, the sure. more productive yeah. they're likely That's to true. become. So yeah. this just shows that the fact that everybody started going for higher and uh, degree-level apprenticeships shows that there was a need for it, that mm. there's still this huge need. It's a good thing, but at mm. the same time, I think part of the problem, maybe a small part of the problem was that that levy payers were in a way encouraged to use up their levy funds. And mm. when you have a big amount of money in your account and you are not incentivized to negotiate when you know mm. that these funds will expire, you will be inclined to pick the most expensive apprenticeships yeah. and spend as much as possible. You want to get your money back, yeah. Charlotte, do you think the, the levy as a concept was perhaps missold by ministers? Because if you think about it, we spent, before the levy came in, as taxpayers two and a half billion pounds in England on apprenticeships. The levy came in, it raises around about the same, two and a half billion, and then the rest goes to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland as devolved expenditure. But of course, the quid pro quo with employers was certainly the levy paying employers is, oh yeah, you're going to get taxed on three million pounds and above of your payroll at 0.5 percent well but don't worry you can get the money back if you take on apprentices but actually that money has to pay for the whole system including chinari your members that are saying through the procurement the contracting route they can't now get the funding for the apprenticeship slots they want to offer so what circle are we trying to try and square here i think without doubt the levy has caused businesses to think differently where they may have looked at their future talent where their skills and upskilling of their staff, actually where they get new, younger people coming through their organisations. I think the levy has forced them to think of that differently. And I think it has played a massive part in that turn to apprenticeships. And 
you know, I, I'm talking to a number of businesses who never, ever took on apprentices before, but now they're beginning to really, really do see the benefit of that programme. So did come in, and I think initially it was like, this is a tax we need to get back. But now that thinking has happened, people are beginning to really see the benefits of having apprentices instilled in their business, whether that be talent growth, upskilling, or actually new talent. Chara, other business groups have also concerned about the operation of the levy and they put suggestions to the Chancellor as part of the spending review like for example should it be a broader skills based levy potentially that talks to your point about clearly employers have a need not only for apprenticeships but for all sorts of skills and workforce development you could argue well if they're being taxed in effect to pay for it why can't they then choose what kind of training that they need I mean would your members at the FSB support that kind of move or do you think actually we need to stick with the principle that it is an apprenticeship levy and and tweak the apprenticeship levy and how apprenticeships are funded at all levels and all ages to get the system right there first. I mean, on balance, where would your members fit on that? So I think my personal opinion is that we should stick with the apprenticeship levy and small businesses would struggle. They already pay four different types of tax and asking, as I was saying earlier, micro businesses is the largest group in the small business mm. spectrum. That That's like less people. than 10 employees, is it? Or less than five? Less than yeah. 10. Less than 10. So yeah. asking those people that are already strained, they, they have so many different concerns uh, to pay another tax on top of what they already pay would be too much. So I don't think it should become a skills levy. It should stay an apprenticeship levy. It's just the, the system needs to be redesigned, revised and made work for everyone, not just for levy pairs. Chancellor because- Exchequer phoned you up, Charlotte, and asked you for advice on what you should do about this levy, raising £2.4 billion pounds a year. And, and you know, he wants to make it work better. What would you say to him? I think there is something around the funding that needs to be addressed. We've got a lot of disparity on the funding bands, some positive, some negative. Yeah, I think There are 30 really... of these thund- um, funding bands, aren't they? Absolutely. So, so not all apprenticeships are priced at the same. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I think we really need to understand that. We need to then actually look what the true cost of endpoint assessment is. So we're actually coming up with an efficient but workable model. I think there's a lot of efficiencies that could be gained and cost savings to support the Treasury if we just looked at it slightly differently got the experts around the table and actually said what is the true cost of delivery, true cost assessment and actually come up with something of measuring those knowledge, skills and behaviours. Do you think also though that the government should adopt the principle, I mean just coming back to the FSB's members, you know these smaller micro firms that says look if any employer out there wants to offer an apprenticeship which after all is always a, uh, about a skilled programme. It is to a structured programme of training. Um, obviously, the employers, because they've been involved in the standards development, it is about occupational competence. It's not just about going off and doing a course just for the sake of it. Not that there's particularly anything wrong with that either, but this is about growing UK PLC and our productivity. I mean, do you think that government should adopt, Gennaro, this sort of principle that if employers want to offer an apprenticeship, the government actually should find a way of funding it. After all, if you become unemployed, regardless of where we are in the economic cycle, government doesn't turn around and say, sorry, that budget of Social Security was capped at X, we're not paying any benefits out now. It accepts it's got a kind of responsibility to make that happen in a, in a modern economy. What, what absolutely. I absolutely agree with that, that if small businesses, any business wants to hire apprentices, they should be allowed and they should be supported to mm. hire apprentices as well as train those apprentices and assess them as well. I mean, is it about the new hires? Because I, I guess also you've seen a lot of activity since the new apprenticeship forms come in where, and again, it's the point about the management space, where actually there's been a lot of upskilling of existing employees. So I suppose from Treasury's perspective, Charlotte, they don't necessarily see that as you know, good for job creation because arguably all you're doing is you're upgrading skills. It, it, you know, it's a good thing in itself, but you always get into then this bit of an argument with the Treasury Mandarin types who say, "Oh yeah, but if we just fund every apprenticeship in their jargon, will it be just dead weight?" In other words, we're paying for stuff that would have been paid for anyway. Which the, the argument is, well, if the employers are paying for it via the levy, well, surely it doesn't matter. I don't know. So I think originally I would have been all for how do we get more 16 to 18 into jobs through apprenticeships, mm. and I still think absolutely Absolutely, we should be doing that. I think it's more around how do we ensure that some of the apprenticeship levy is also being used to support new talent into businesses or upskill current workforce and how do we properly measure that so we know it is being utilised in the right way. 
Okay. Could I also add that Please. apprenticeships are a relatively low cost way of hiring new staff for small mm. businesses and grow their business and increase their productivity. Because you and pay the apprenticeship wage and it's outside of national yeah, minimum first year. wage legislation for the exactly. first year. Yeah. So it's not their fault that the apprenticeships now cost twice more than what it used to cost. And mm-hmm. because the government has reformed the system and set these upper limits, apprenticeship standards are now a lot more expensive than the frameworks. And if small businesses want to hire apprentices, they should be supported, just to add to the point I made earlier. Yeah. Broader technical education reform. Obviously, apprenticeships is a is a key part of that work-based uh, approach to skills and productivity. Does Federation Small Business have a view about the government's approach to T-levels? Because Charlotte mentioned there about in an ideal world, we want to see more 16 to 18-year-olds in apprenticeships. But the way things seem to be shaking out is the government's taking a view now with, of course, the participation age having risen to 18 years old it's sort of saying there's going to be three routes potentially in the future for 16 to 18 year olds you go down the well understood academic GCSE A level university route although there's problems with that these new untested but nevertheless T levels will be on offer from next September 24 of those qualifications in the marketplace and of course we'll still have apprenticeships and potentially a whole range of other qualifications I mean where does the sort of FSB and your members small firms I mean are they aware of T levels are they sort of can't wait for them to be available so they can start to offer the work placements that go along with T-levels? Well, some of them are aware, obviously, but... um, But you say awareness levels are low. ...are very low because they haven't yet started. Mm -hmm. But we are supportive of T-levels broadly, and we Mm -hmm. think that there needs to be an alternative for apprenticeships, and it's good that they're classroom-based and they will will have an industry placement element. But the only problem was it that industry placements may not be available across the country everywhere. Yeah, postcode lottery is... Exactly. So that means that... Small businesses, for example, they have no incentive at all to engage with this scheme and across the country, whereas they're available everywhere across the country. There are small businesses in all parts of the country, unlike large businesses. So the government has to incentivize small businesses to join the T-level scheme and provide industry placements. It might be, in the long term, it might be a really good program. And the fact that there will Mm. be now three routes might be a bit concerning now. And it's really hard to tell how they will turn out. But in the long term we'll see and it's also about employers how they're going to to differentiate between classroom based program with industry placement like work placement element and an apprenticeship at the same level so my thinking is that employers prefer work experience rather than a classroom based education so how they're going to react to apprenticeships at the same level and t levels which employees they will prefer to indeed and you put your finger on a point in terms of previous attempts at trying to integrate work-based learning with study programs is often where those particular qualifications 14 to 19 diplomas for example came unstuck charlotte will remember those charlotte you're a member of the federation of awarding bodies board so you've been quite sort of active as well in the conversation around t levels again i mean where do you see t levels in the landscape of apprenticeships and traditional qualifications and indeed other qualifications i mean is that landscape going to be clearer and well understood in the future or potentially more complex than it is even now? I think we need to get to a stage where it's less complicated and understood, particularly when we're talking to small businesses, mm-hmm. so they understand actually the pathways within it. Ultimately, we have a skill system and the skill system is there to get people successfully into jobs. We need to be able to clearly show those pathways of how that is getting people into a job and then the making the decisions that are right and appropriate for that endpoint in mind. Indeed. Now, I want uh, to close this podcast by both making you a uh, skills and apprenticeship minister for the day. Now, given that we lost (laughs) a previous skills and apprenticeship minister and indeed there's a bit of a campaign underway to try and get one reappointed, it could quite possibly be either of you. So, Janara, I mean, if, if you were in charge of this brief in government for a day and obviously given your small business background, what... What change would you make? Just sort of talk me through very briefly what the conversation would be with the with the civil servants in trying to get some 
change. I would lobby for funding for redesign. You'd be making the decision. You wouldn't be lobbying. You'd be the, you'd be the person well, in the hot the seat. The thing is that the Treasury decides in terms yes, of funding. Indeed, so well, lobby so I tre- have to lobby. Uh, yeah, well, of course. Lobby is probably well, you've got the good uh, skill set for, for that. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. speak to Treasury about uh, more funding. And then also I would focus on 20% of the job training. Why is it that it's such a big problem for small businesses and work on that? Just briefly, I mean, on the concept of 20%, which is sort of broad terms is about a day of a five-day working week obviously it can be apportioned in 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 different ways is it that your members are against the principle of time off to train or is it just the practical constraints around organizing the mentoring the management the coordination of somebody being out of the office and say if it's a business of less than five or less than ten you know that's 20 percent of your workforce if it's a five-person business that's just out of the business so is that is it practical or is it more philosophical than that you just don't think it's a good idea to have off the job training it's not philosophical i think it's about what the value that brings they're losing employees time but they if they see that the employee is not spending that time for training or learning and and that happens quite often they get frustrated because they don't see the point of losing that, that employee for 20 percent right. of the time so that that's the that's the problem i think that's the case studies small what i've heard from small businesses they say mm. that training product providers advise that the employee should be released for a day but there is no guidance on what they should be doing or what they don't know what they're doing. OK, Charlotte, you're now the minister and you've got this delegation of uh, pesky Federation of Small Business people in front of you saying they think they 20 percent off the job training isn't working. What, what would be your response to that? I think firstly, what I do is take stock. I think we don't need any more massive change. We need to just stop, take stock review what's working, tweak what's not and provide some stability to the sector. I think that would then start giving FSB what they needed along with its members and other employers. Well, it sounds to me like we probably need to get both of you in the government and get a lot more sense out of you than what we're getting now. So, Chinara Ristamova, Senior Policy Advisor, Education and Skills at the Federation of Small Business, Charlotte Bosworth, MD at Innovate Awarding. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Sign up to Skills World at www.fenews.co.uk